morning. Let's try that again one more time. Good morning. Good to see you guys this morning. So we'll get to what that has to do with the sermon in a minute, because I can tell you right now, if my mom is watching at home, she's like, son, I, you're going to have to explain what that had to do with anything. I wasn't just trying to advertise Snickers to make you all hungry. So today we're going to talk about course corrections, and we should have known, I told Randy, Randy had two signs that things were going to be difficult today. The first one was that Tracy handed him a mask that said the words, technical difficulties, please stand by. <laughs> the second one being that the pastor is doing a message on course correction and what to do in storms. So the internet went down. I said, Randy, I'll go reset it. I unplugged the wrong thing and plugged it back in and made it worse. So then Randy had to run out and go do that. It was just an exciting, exciting day. But, uh, but Rodney did a great job. Of course, he had to run out and answer a phone call. So, you know, it's just that. You ever just had that kind of, anybody ever have that kind of just, kind of just, okay. So we just wanted to show you that we're real. And so there it is. Um, here's the series verse. Philippians 3.14, no matter what goes on in your life, I, I would encourage you, memorize this verse. I press towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ, or excuse me, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So it's okay to have goals, and our, but our goals need to be centered on what God wants us to do and not just on our selfish desires and the things we want. But the truth is, listen, no matter who you are, no matter whether you could be in the center of God's will, and still you are going to deal with storms. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. I would have loved it if Jesus said, in this world, you might have trouble. In this world, perhaps you'll have trouble. In this world, if you don't behave, you'll have trouble. Or if you don't trust me enough, or if you don't have faith, you'll have trouble. No, no. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And so the truth is, we all have storms, and your friends have storms. So if you're going through a time right now... Maybe you're not in a storm. Maybe right now your life, you can just breathe deeply and you're like, you know, I'm at a good spot and this is a good time. But I promise you that somebody in your life is going through a storm. And so today, not only do I want to give you just some practical things that I know work because I've applied them in my life, okay? And these things work and I don't always get there instantly, I'll be honest with you, but when I get there. These are things that will help not only you to weather a storm, but will help you to be compassionate to other people when they're weathering a storm. Not just to look at them and tell them to get over it or pray harder or maybe you should just have more faith. Uh, dumb things that Christians say to each other. Um, but the truth is I want to help you with these three things that are from this great story about probably the best Christian. Uh, uh, theologians would argue that Paul was the most devout Christian ever uh, because of what he went through. And uh, we're going to look at that story today. And here's what I know. No matter what goes on, when a storm comes, you have options. You can let the storm just beat you up, or you can make choices that will make the storm worse, <laughs> right? Or make it better. And we've all had those moments where we had an umbrella, and if you live in Florida, you've had your umbrella out, and all of a sudden a great wind came up. How many of you had your umbrella turned inside out? Anybody had that fun? Boy, that's a joy. You feel like you live in Chicago for just a moment, right? But the truth is, for all of us in life, sometimes, no matter how big your umbrella, how strong your faith, there are things that happen where you're going to go through a struggle. You're going to go through a challenge. It may be a physical challenge. It may be an emotional challenge. It may be a spiritual challenge. It, it could be something physical where you, you go to the doctor and you get a report. It could be something emotional where you're just struggling with dealing with a certain event or something in your life. Listen, whatever it is today, as we look at these stories, you know, the awesome part about Scripture is you can look at stories that are thousands of years old. And God's Word is so inspired that you take these principles from God's Word and you apply those principles to today. And it's life-changing even to this moment. So today we're going to talk about when life gives you a storm, and I'm going to give you three things to do, okay? Number one, when life gives you a storm, trust God and encourage others. Now, trusting God does not mean that you always feel safe. There are times that your emotions don't feel safe. It's natural for us sometimes when we're going through stress, when we're going through a trial, to feel flustered and frustrated. But trusting God means that we go to Him and we say, God, I don't understand 
but I'm going to trust you. And when you do that and you begin to look for what God's doing in your life, then you can also encourage others. Now, let me tell you what's happening in this story. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 27 today. And I talked about this story a few months ago in a little different light. Paul, at this point, was told, and he knew he was going to go to Jerusalem. And he actually knew he would be threatened as he went to Jerusalem, but he knew that's what God wanted him to do. And then he also knew from there that God was going to send him to Rome. By the way, Rome was the place that Paul would eventually uh, be killed. And a lot of Christians were killed, of course, as Nero uh, came in as part of Rome. And so Paul is headed from Jerusalem to Rome, and this is his trip. And I'm sure when he got on this boat with Luke and and maybe some other uh, disciples, as he got on this boat and was headed to Rome, I'm sure he thought it was going to be a straight shot. I mean, he traveled a lot, but I will tell you, between you and me, I would not get on a boat with Paul any more than I would get on any transportation with Tom Hanks, okay? I mean, every Tom Hanks movie, something right. So if you get on a plane and Tom Hanks walks on, I just want to encourage you to say, I'll take the next one, but you'll be three hours late. Well, it's better than what being on an island for three years, right, or whatever, that's how it would have been with Paul. When you, if you were a shipmate and Paul walked on and you knew his history, you'd be like, dude, this guy gets in wrecks. It's like driving with some of your friends. We all have that one friend that we're like, don't ride with them, right? Or in my case, a child. Okay, sorry, I said that out loud. Acts 27, verse 21 to 26 says this. After they had gone a long time without food... Paul stood up before them and said, and I love this, this is very Pauline, here we go, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. You ever, you ever, you ever do a, I told you so? This is a I told you so moment, but he doesn't leave it there. He's not just trying to say I told you so, he goes on from there. Then you would have spared yourself this damage in life. By the way, loss. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying that you and I can make a choice that impacts what happens to us. That it's not just God deciding, okay, this is what I'm going to throw at you now. They made a choice to go against wisdom. And because they went against wisdom, Paul says, now you've suffered. This goes against people who think that everything you do, you just go down the street. You don't have to pay attention when you're driving because God's will, God's will, God's will. Listen, God gives you options inside of his perfect will, and this is one of them. And he will use even the difficulties in your life, even when other people make choices that will hurt you. And so these guys were impatient. They didn't listen to Paul. They took a vote. That's always a good start, right? I love churches that, okay, majority wins, you know, and so they vote to never have ministry again because it costs too much money, and they sit and die, right? I've been in churches like that, right? And so what do you do? You say, God, what do you want us to do? And Paul said, listen, don't do it. And then he continues. He says, I urge you, keep up your courage. So what was happening? Well, they had already thrown stuff overboard. Uh, Many uh, theologians think they actually took the main sail that's heavy and tall and threw it overboard. Can you imagine? That's like taking the engine out of your car and sitting on I-4. I mean, it's like, why would you do that? Well, because you thought you were going to die. And so now they've begun to lose courage. He says, because, listen to this, not one of you will be lost. And then then he, you can see the ship owner at this point, the captain looking at him, and he says, only the ship will be lost. Which Paul says it like it's not a big deal, which at this point it probably isn't a big deal to them. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And then he says this, Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So even though Paul knew what God was going to do, he still didn't know everything that was going to happen. Listen, when you go through a storm, you don't know what's next. Paul didn't know exactly what's next. He knew the big picture, but he didn't know the next details. We're going to run around somewhere. It's It's going to be tough. We're going to have a fight. What did Paul do? Paul here was encouraging them. Now, Paul was encouraging them, but we don't think of this, what he did, as encouragement. Because what's the first thing Paul says? You shouldn't have done that. What did he do? Paul was speaking the truth in love. 
He was saying to them, hey, learn to listen. (laughs) Learn to pay attention to the signs. If you're going to be a sailor, you really should pay attention to the winds. I mean, I've done this a couple of times already, guys. You probably should have listened to me. I've done the whole storm thing. Pay attention. See, and we have these moments. It's like when you go to the doctor and you, you finish your, you know, the first thing they, you know what the first thing they do when you go to the doctor is, do you remember? First thing they do, put you on the scale, right? Why do they do that? Because they want to tell you what your problem starts with, right? In America, right? That's our number one, right? We know that's our number one, right? And then they take your pulse and blood pressure, all that stuff. And then the doctor comes in and says, you want the good news or the bad news? And typically you just go, whatever you want. Well, the good news is you're not going to die yet. But you've got to get, and then they tell you, your blood pressure under control or your sugar under control or your weight under control or, you know, whatever they tell you. What are they doing? They care about you, so they're telling you what's wrong. The doctor doesn't just look at you and say, well, I just want to encourage them. So when you come in, you get your blood pressure and all, they just go, huh, looks good. If your doctor does that, you need a new doctor, okay? Because they're trying to help you. And so the deal is this. When Paul looks at these men and says, hey, you should have listened to me. Then he gives them the good news. But here's what we can do next. And several times after this, Paul does that. He says, here's what we can do next. And guess what? They started listening to Paul. They started paying attention to him. He was giving a difficult truth. Listen, some of you today need to give yourself a difficult truth. Some of you just need to be honest. It's early in the year. Maybe early in the year you said, I want to spend more time in prayer. And if you're honest with yourself today, this year for you looks just like last year. You pray when an emergency happens, and that's about it. You come on Sunday and maybe spend some time in the Bible, but you haven't seen it since then. A difficult truth could be, I've got to spend time daily in God's word. I've got to spend time daily in prayer. It could be a physical problem. Maybe, hey, you know what? I got to quit eating popcorn. It's just too good. I can't have those Snickers anymore. That's not what the illustration is about. But, you know, here's your first question. Who can I encourage even in my storm? One of the things I've noticed about life is if you're not careful in a storm, you'll become selfish and self-centered. And God has not created you just to be selfish and self-centered. Some of the neatest people I've known are people that I visited in the hospital who were dying and prayed for me. Pastor, how can I pray for you? And, And that makes, I can't even tell you the impression that makes on me when I go in. And so many times I get caught up in the little things of life. And you and I get caught up in the little things of life. But the truth is, regardless of what's happening around us, God has given us the ability to look to others and say, God, what do you want me to do? I'm going to skip this next uh, uh, quote here, Randy. All right, we're going to go to number two. Take care of your needs and others. Now, Jesus gave two commands. Number one, love God with everything, right? And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. But that's a two-part command. And let me tell you what I found with most Christians. Now, it's not all Christians. There are selfish people in the world. Don't hear me wrong. There are selfish and self-centered Christians everywhere. But what I have found so often is that people are so busy doing God's will, taking care of other people, that they don't take time to love God. And they don't take time... To love themselves. And when you do that, you will burn out. You will get exhausted. You will wonder why the Christian life is so frustrating. They've actually discovered, speaking of Snickers, that hangry is a thing. That when you are hungry, anger is more natural. When you are hungry, your body actually produces that fight or flight, those hormones, and they can make you uh, see something neutral as negative. That's why so many families get in fights right before dinner time, right? Because people are feeling grumpy. They haven't eaten. Their blood sugar, all those things happen. And even in Scripture, God cares even about your physical health. How do I know that? Listen to what Paul says. Just before dawn, Paul urged all of them to eat. For the last 14 days, you have been in constant suspense And gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Imagine being in a tropical storm or even a hurricane on the ocean in about a hundred foot 
old-fashioned ship, washing everywhere, throwing things overboard, and you're not eating at all. So what does Paul say to them? Now, I urge you, take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you, I love this, will lose a single hair from their head. And I'm sure the balding guys were like, really? That's awesome, right? After he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all, broke it, and began to eat. What did Paul say? Well, I'm eating. And I, I've been with a lot of you dads, and you pray, and you don't care if the kids are ready to eat or not. You're like, dear Lord, thanks for this food. And the kids are like, wait, I'm not even at the table yet. And you're like, hey, you're on your own. Paul's like, he breaks up any, why? As an example to them. And so what happens? They were all encouraged and ate food themselves. What were they encouraged by? Paul's words and Paul's example. Do you hear me? When you're going through a storm, other people are watching you. How do you respond? Do you respond in fear and frustration and yelling and anger and you need a Snickers, right? Or do you say, you know what? I've got to take care of me. Why? Because I'm selfish and self-centered? No, no. So I can take care of you. I've got to take care of my basic needs. Why? So I can love other people. Even Jesus got a way to rest. Even Jesus fell asleep on a boat in a storm because he needed rest. You need rest. You need sleep. You need encouragement. You need time in prayer. You need time to get still. You need time to take care of you so that you can take care of others even better. Because, by the way, if you're grumpy and frustrated, most people who you help don't really want your help at that moment anyway. You ever had that moment where you're like, please don't help me, if you're going to be that way, right? Altogether, there were 276 of us on board when they had eaten as much as they wanted. Now, for some people, that takes a while. They lighten the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. I want to encourage you. When the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself, God assumes you love you. But I've met a lot of Christians, the way you talk to yourself, you would never talk to someone else. Remember that you are also God's child. And so when you put yourself down, if you're like me and you are working on a project and you drop a screw and you yell at yourself, which I do every time I'm working on that, I literally drop something and I go, Brookins! I yell at myself and I realize, wait a second, I'm yelling at myself for doing something that if somebody else did it, I would say, well, you just dropped a screw. What's the big deal? What do you, what do you think? You're the perfect holder of things, right? Many of you are hard on yourselves all the time. I want to encourage you. Now, I'm not saying to do this selfish love thing that's in the world, okay? But what I'm saying is you need to realize that you are God's child too and you need to care for yourself. I want you to take a moment. I just want to pat yourself, pat yourself on the shoulder. Just pat yourself. Just do that. All right? Now, that's weird. I want to tell you, that's a weird thing to do. But some of you are never kind to yourself. And you are God's child just as much as your children, your grandchildren, that person that you care about. So quit beating yourself up and not taking care of you because you think as a Christian somehow you're supposed to be destroyed every day. We surrender our lives to Christ, but there were times that even Jesus walked away from the crowd to get alone. So am I taking care of my needs and looking out for others? Because the truth is, when you realize how much God loves you and cares about you, when you really love God with everything, you do that first, then you realize that He loves you, then guess what? It overflows to other people. If you're always dry, if you're always frustrated, if you're always irritated, if you're always picking on you, guess what? It's going to be hard to love the people around you or even pay attention to them. And the truth is, self-loathing, you ready, is selfish. Self-loathing, self-hate is selfish. You're just thinking of you. The only way you can think of others is if you receive God's love first and then go outside of that. So trust God and encourage others. Take care of your needs and others. Number three, look for ways for God to use you. And this doesn't have to be complicated. So they wash up. The boat breaks apart. They get on land. There's a couple things that happen. If you get a chance to read Acts 27, 28, great story. They get on land. They are not where they're supposed to be. You ever not where you're supposed to be? 
Maybe somebody died that you thought was going to be with you today. Maybe you're going through a physical trial you didn't know you were going to go through. Maybe emotionally you're not where you thought you'd be today. Paul was not where he thought he would be, but guess what? He said, well, God, I'm here. Use me. The truth is, sometimes when we're not where we're supposed to be, or where we think we're supposed to be, we use that as an excuse for not being obedient. Oh, well, I can't help because I'm dealing with this. I can't serve because I'm dealing with this. I I can't help in that ministry because I'm dealing with this. Listen, if you do that, guess what? You will die not helping anyone because you'll always have something going on that you can make an excuse. Even though Paul was somewhere he didn't want to be and doing something he didn't want to do, he said, I'm going to just be available to God. He got bit by a snake right before this. I don't know about you, but I get bit by a snake and I'm laying in bed for a month. I'm just going to stare at it, see if it swells up. Right? What does Paul do? He gets right back to it. He goes and he gets invited to stay at this person's house. It says his father was sick in bed, suffering from a fever and dysentery. Now, scholars think this is from goat's milk. I don't know how they know that. Sounds good to me. There was some goat's milk apparently in that town that was not good for you. Although goat fudge is awesome. Paul went in to see him. And after prayer, what did Paul do? Placed his hands on him and healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways. And we were ready to sail. They furnished us with the supplies we needed. Paul knew that he had the gift to be able to heal people. Later in his ministry, he didn't heal people. But early, still early in this time, he's still healing people. God's using him in this way. And different times in your life, God will use you different ways. It might be just to bring a word of encouragement to somebody. It might be to mow somebody's yard. It might be to fix somebody's car. It might be to help in our sound and and, uh, uh, video back here on Sundays. It might be to greet at the door. It might be to help in the children's ministry. It might be to reach out to your neighbor. The other night we were expecting a delivery and people get lost on the way to our house. So it was dark and I walked out to the corner, had my little, because you know know what flashlight we use now, right? We don't actually have a flashlight. What do we have? We have our phone. So I have my flashlight on my phone and I'm, I'm walking towards the street and some teenagers in a golf cart come by with the radio cranking and they're singing Taylor Swift at the top of their lungs. It sounded awful, by the way. And they're jamming out. And at first I got a little aggravated, you know, because we're getting old. So everything aggravates us that has to do with a teenager, right? So at first I'm aggravated. And then I realized, you know what? What I was doing was much worse than what they're doing. I hope they're having a good time. And as I thought that, some neighbors were walking by. And these kids went by. And now the sound went. And I said to them, well, I was doing a lot worse things when I was their age. And she said, I was just saying that to my husband. And they said, we've been wanting to meet you. You're Pastor Eric. And I'm thinking, it's a good thing I didn't say something really bad. She said, our other neighbors have been watching you online and they told us about you, but we haven't gotten to meet you yet. To which I said, well, you really should meet my wife if you want the nice one or something. I don't know. Listen, you never know when those opportunities to reach out to somebody are going to come. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be that you're at a restaurant and you pay for somebody's meal or you pay for the person behind you at Dunkin' Donuts just looking for little ways to bless people. It could be that you at work are are dealing with something and you see somebody who's upset and you just say, hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. It doesn't even have to be this huge thing. It could be little. But a thousand little things make a difference in people's lives every day. And here's the deal. You're going to go through storms. You cannot stop being faithful in the storm. Because God lets you walk on water in storms. But you have to trust him. You have to be available to him. You have to encourage others. You have to take care of your needs. I'm not saying take care of all your wants, but take care of your needs. Put the oxygen mask on you first. And then look for ways for God to use you. No matter what storm happens in your life, listen. You can choose to make it worse by getting angry and frustrated and yelling and cussing and making everybody around you life miserable. Or, God, I'm going to get under your umbrella of authority. I'm going to trust you when the storm comes. I don't understand it. I don't like it. But instead of cussing at the storm, I'm just going to thank you and be faithful to you in the middle of it. God can use you regardless of what you're going through. 
And I want to encourage you today. If while I was talking about storms, you thought of somebody that you know, call that person today. Email them, text them, send them a note, and just say, hey, I just want you to know I thought of you in church today, and I prayed for you. Let them know. And you know what else we can do as Christians? Sometimes other people need your umbrella too. So don't be afraid to lend it out. If you're here today or you're watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died because we're sinners, we're messed up, we're broken. We fail and we falter. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes, that's a word for faith, whoever trusts in him will not perish but have eternal life. If you want eternal life today, that relationship with God, I'd love to talk to you after church about what that means. If you're watching online, you can send me a note, an email, a text, whatever's easy for you. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. As a Christian here today, I want to encourage you, don't let this message dissipate right when you leave here. Maybe take these notes with you. Let's let God work on you this week. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments, these minutes. I pray, Father, that in our lives, when we go through tough things, help us not to become selfish and self-centered. But Lord, help us also not to think that we don't need help or encouragement or love, or to even eat. So, Father, I pray, as we learn to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, that we could also learn to love others as we love ourselves. May we walk in that, no matter the storm that's around us. In Jesus' name, amen.